Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for attending uh, this Hydra session, everyone. Uh, I'm Lipe from Miguel. Uh, so the plan for today's Hydra session is first we will have this lecture for about one hour to, uh, together, and then uh, we will compile the framework and then uh, do the first exercise. So uh, when we compile the code, it may take like 15 minutes. Uh, when the code compiles, we can take a break. Okay, so uh, the title of this uh, lecture is Bulk Dynamics of the Quarkulon Plasma. Um, and this is the outline of this uh, lecture. First, I will briefly talk about the multi-stage description of heavy inclusions. And then uh, we will derive some relativistic ideal hydrodynamics. Yeah. We will talk about the transverse expansion in heavy ion collisions, and then we will look at some uh, relativistic dissipative hydrodynamic equations, and we discuss dissipative effects in heavy ion collisions. Uh, finally, I will briefly talk about data-driven constraints on QCD matter properties. Um, so let, let's start with the first uh, section. We know uh, when we, uh, in our field, we need uh, to carry out heavy ion collisions. Um, so uh, what people do is to accelerate two beams of ions uh, to near the speed of light and then let them collide. So this is an illustration of a nucleus-nucleus collision. Two nuclei, they are moving uh, along the beam direction near the speed of light. And this is the overlap region. You can create a very hot and dense uh, QCD matter. Um, and finally, uh, people uh, measure those uh, stable final hydrons, for example. And that is uh, all we have. Uh, the experimentalists can um, get some observables for those final particles. Um, so let me uh, show you this uh, natural scales uh, for size and lifetime. Uh, in our field, you can see one Fermi and one Fermi University, they are really small scales uh, compared to those uh, used in our daily life. Um, so to extract the properties of the evolution in heavy ion collisions, we need to do mod model to data comparison, uh, use the experimental measurements. Um, so on the uh, modeling side, we usually use this multi-stage description of heavy ion collisions. That is because the systems in heavy ion collisions, usually, uh, they did go through several quite different stages. Um, so here, um, this is the the stage before the collision, uh, and then those two, uh, th those two nuclei, they are Lorenz, highly Lorentz contracted because they are traveling near the speed of light. And then they collide with, it, with each other and pass through each other. This is, um, uh, between them, it creates a very hot and dense uh, uh, matter uh, where the quarks and the gluons can be liberated from the nucleons, um, that is the quark gluon plasma. It evolves hydrodynamically and it expands and cools down. Finally, those partons will get confined into hydrons again. And those hydrons can um, uh, collide and decay. Finally, we get some stable particles. And then we can calculate those observable uh, to compare to experimental uh, measurements. And that is how we do this uh, modeling. Um, so in this bulk dynamics section, uh, we, um, we want to describe those soft particles, which has, uh, which have a low uh, moment, uh, transverse momentum, um, and they are more than uh, ninety-five percent of the total final particles. Um, so, as we see, the these the system goes through several different stages. Um, so, we need the, the different models to model different stages. Uh, uh, we need some pre-hydro stage uh, dynamics to describe the collisions, and then we switch to uh, dissipative relativistic hydrodynamics to describe the evolution with the quark gluon plasma, and then we do particleization to convert hydrodynamic fields into particles, and then finally we do this hydronic transport to let those hydrons uh, rescatter, and then we get the final particles. Um, so in practice, you need different codes, and then you pass the output of one code as input for the next code. Uh, and in fact, we need to do uh, millions and millions of events because we need high statistics. Uh, this is uh, 
of course, this is not an easy task. And that's why we uh, have this, uh, we want to use this JetScape framework. Um, so JetScape uh, has, uh, has done those interfaces between different uh, uh, stages for you. And uh, um, besides the collaboration has put uh, uh, some default modules for those different stages. And uh, that is what we are gonna to use uh, for this uh, session today. Okay, we, are, we will focus on the soft sector of this framework to describe soft particles. Um, before uh, I move on, uh, I should also mention uh, this is uh, some uh, um, simplification people usually use for modeling at very high beam energies. Uh, people usually uh, assume this biocomp bio boost invariance. So the idea is because those two, uh, because those two colliding nuclei, they are traveling near the speed of light. So as an observer, if we boost ourselves relative to this. Uh, to this uh, collision system, we shouldn't see any difference in the physics. And uh, you should see some uh, uh, boost invariance uh, in the observables as well. Um, and uh, this is the measurements of charged particle distribution as a function of pseudo rapidity. Um, so this is basically the longitudinal direction. Um, we can see at this LHC energy, uh, near mid rapidity, we do see some biochem boost uh, invariant uh, plateau. So here you see some dips, uh, that is only because uh, um, there is a Jacobian from uh, rapidity to pseudo rapidity. Um, on the other hand, we can also see the measurements of uh, yields of uh, particles, antiparticles, especially the baryons, antibaryons. You can see they uh, add those uh, LHC energies, they uh, basically have exactly the same yields. So that means that uh, net baryon density is uh, zero near mid rapidity at those high beam energies. So uh, people usually make those two uh, simplifications for LHC modeling. Um, uh, first, we assume boost invariance so that we can focus on one slice of, uh, of the evolution and then uh, ignore the other uh, species uh, so, so, so that we can uh, save the computational time. Um, and uh, we focus on mid rapidity. Uh, and also we ignore the evolution of variant density. Um, however, at low beam energies, this is not the case. For example, these are the charged particle distribution and net proton distribution at the beam energy scan energies. Apparently you can see uh, this net proton distribution has um, very non-trivial distributions as function of rapidity. Um, um, so that means we need to include uh, those non-trivial rapidity dependent dynamics for low beam energies. Um, besides, we see uh, the proton number is uh, much larger than the antiproton number. So uh, that means we have really non-zero net baryon density and we need to consider their, its evolution. Um, okay, um, any questions so far? No, okay. So, okay, now let's move to the next session. We will derive some relativistic ideal hydrodynamic equations. Um, um, so when, uh, let's first talk about this local thermodynamic equilibrium. So this is because uh, generally, conventionally people believe hydrodynamics is only applicable for systems that are not far away from local thermodynamic equilibrium. So what does it mean? Um, so let's start with those two colliding nuclei again. Those colored nucleons are the participants, and then we can produce this uh, quark gluon plasma. Um, so you can see uh, this system is not uniform. So it doesn't have uniform uh, temperature, chemical potential, for example. Um, so the properties are uh, different from point to point. So it is uh, local properties. Um, so we can. Assume first this fluid is in thermal dynamic, uh, in local thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, what that means is if we uh, pick one fluid cell at this position, then um, first let's uh, assume this uh, fluid is a static. We is a static. We is, we first ignore the uh, the the expansion. Then that means with this local thermodynamic properties and uh, temperature and the chemical potential, 
the constituents in this fully cell should follow the, this local equilibrium distribution. Uh, they can be both Einstein or Fermi direct distribution. Um, and then uh, we know the, the, the system is highly dynamical. Um, so uh, let's now include the flow, uh, flow uh, the expansion of the system. So now with this collective expansion, besides the local properties, we also have the flow velocity, which is also different from point to point. It, it is also a local property. And now the constituents uh, in this uh, fully cell should follow this uh, Lorentz boosted local equilibrium distribution. So you can see the energy now is, uh, is replaced by U dot P here. Um, so the energy is boosted by the, by the flow velocity. This flow velocity is defined in, as we have learned from relativity and it is normalized. Um, so it has four components, but only three of them are independent. Um, okay, so with this uh, local equilibrium distribution, uh, we can define the energy momentum tensor and the net charge current. Um, okay. Um, so these, they have standard definitions from kinetic theory. Um, so you can see this is the local equilibrium distribution. Um, and then we get the net, net uh, charge current and the energy momentum tensor. Uh, here we sum over different particle species. Um, and this is the uh, charge of uh, different species. So um, this can be different charges. Uh, it can be baryon charge or electric charge, then we get different uh, net, ch net charge currents. <clears throat> so we say this is uh, um, the microscopic dis uh, definition of those quantities because we are talking about the particle distribution function. Um, to derive uh, hydrodynamic equations, we, we want to introduce some microscopic uh, uh, definitions of those quantities. Um, so what we do is, um, um, you can see this is the definition from the previous slide, and then we uh, decompose uh, those uh, variables, uh, this, those quantities, uh, using some microscopic uh, variables. We introduce some new, new uh, variables here. Um, so here, this is the microscopic definition, and then this is the microscopic definition. Um, so uh, without, before we ask, ask uh, what the physical meanings of those quantities, we can uh, see basically this is just to re-impress those, uh, those quantities based on their tensor structure. This is the vector, this is uh, a, a tensor, right? So here you can think of this term as the temporal uh, components because u mu can be thought of as a temporal projector because when you use it to act on um, some vector, for example, and then when you go to the local rest frame, what left is the uh, temporal component. This uh, delta mu nu is the spatial projector uh, because it is orthogonal to this temporal uh, projector. Uh, so basically we, we separate this t mu nu into the temporal component and spatial component. Um, Okay, now we can ask what the physical meanings of those quantities. Um, so to do this, first we can project out those uh, quantities. For example, a mu, we use the temporal projector to act, to act on uh, net current, and then we get uh, this part, okay? Similarly for this E and P. <clears throat> so when U mu uh, acts on a mu, it contracts with this P mu, here, that is what we got uh, u dot p here. Um, so uh, still those e expressions are not that straightforward to understand. So what do we do is we go to this local rest frame where u mu only has this uh, te temporal component. So that means we are co-moving with the fluid cell. It looks rest to us. Uh, when uh, we boost ourselves to the local rest frame of that fluid. And now we can calculate those quantities um, in the local rest frame. Um, and that is what we get here. So 
For example, u dot p becomes uh, p zero in the local rest frame, and it cancels out with this p zero, and that is what left. So apparently, you can see um, this uh, expression means the particle, the charge density. Okay, so this part is particle density, and this is the charge charge. So this is charge density, and this is the energy density, and this is pressure. So, so now we uh, uh, obtain the decomposition of those two quantities uh, using some microscopic uh, variables. And uh, we know uh, their meanings. This is the charge density, energy density, and the pressure. These are what they look like in the local rest frame. You can see in the local rest frame, the net charge current only has this uh, temporal component. And uh, in T mu nu energies, the temp temporal component, uh, pressure is in the spatial component. And the T mu nu is uh, diagonal uh, in this ideal fluid case. <clears throat> okay, uh, that is so far what we did um, to get those decomposition. Next, we want to get some dynamics, right? Um, so we can get the dynamics from the conservation laws. Um, so th these are the conservation laws of, uh, of uh, net charges. Um, so because we can consider different charges um, and this is the energy momentum conservation. So in heavy ion collisions, we consider uh, two, uh, three uh, charges, baryon charge, strangeness, and uh, electric charge. Um, okay, now we are ready to get some hydrodynamic equations. Uh, so what we do is to um, rewrite those conservation laws in more intuitive form. So here we will focus on baryon charge only. We ignore the other uh, charges. Um, so this is the uh, conservation law. And then we plug in the decomposition of a meal like this. And then we can expand this uh, term into two terms and we get a new equation. We'll come back to this equation later. Um, this is what we get from uh, energy momentum conservation. We um, similarly, we plug in the decomposition and uh, what do we do next is to project out the temporal and spatial components of this equation. First, we use the temporal uh, projector to act on this equation to get this equation. And then if we get, use the spatial projector to act on this equation, we get uh, this equation. Um, okay, so they are not very straightforward to understand. Then again, we go to the local rest frame where uh, uh, U mu will be, we only have the temporal component. And then what left is this U mu partial mu becomes a uh, partial T, the time derivative. Um, this uh, uh, a partial dot U is just the uh, the expansion rate. So it, it describes uh, the expansion with the fluid. Um, so we can rewrite those uh, two equations first in, in this in this way. So you can see this uh, equation has very straightforward physical meanings. This is just the, deriv the time derivative of the uh, charge density. And this, uh, this is the expansion, right? So when, this, when the fluid is expanding, then this term is positive. With this minus sign, that means because of the expansion, the time derivative of uh, charge density is decreasing. So this only, this, uh, uh, this just means uh, the dilution of the charge density because of the expansion. And similarly for energy density, um, the difference is the energy density get that, gets diluted faster than the uh, baryon density. This is because it has this actual term from pressure. <clears throat> so we will uh, focus on this equation in the next slide. Uh, before that, uh, we can count how many equations we have uh, so far. So we have one equation here, we have one equation here, we have three equations uh, because these are three um, components. So we have five equations in total. On the other hand, we have six anodes. We have uh, baryon density, energy density, pressure, and three independent components of flow velocity. Um, so we have more anodes than the equations we have. Uh, but besides we have 
the equation state, which can give us relationship between thermodynamic properties, for example, the pressure as function of energy and uh, baryon density. So we can reduce one unknown variable. So now we have, uh, we can close the system. Okay, now we can focus on the equation of the uh, flow velocity here. Um, we have obtained this, e this equation in the local rest frame. So um, you can see this is the, again, the time derivative of flow velocity components. And uh, in other words, it is the uh, acceleration of the, flow, uh, of the flow velocity. And here, this is uh, the spatial gradients of pressure. So this equation tells us that the spatial gradient of pressure drives the acceleration of flow. And uh, uh, it happens in different directions. The, the, the gradient of pressure in x direction drives the flow in x direction. Uh, uh, drive the flow acceleration in x direction. On the other hand, uh, this E plus P can be thought of as the inertia of the fluid. When it is larger, then the acceleration will be slower. So this is very similar to Newton's second law. This is the force, this is the mass, and then this is the acceleration. And this is the most, uh, one of the most important uh, insights we can get from the hydrodynamic e equations. So pressure gradients drive the hydrodynamic expansion and uh, entropy is the initial. Okay, now we can apply what we have learned uh, from, from the hydrodynamic equations into heavy ion collision, uh, into heavy ion collisions. Okay, so let's start with this central collision. Uh, so when two spherical nuclei they collide with each other, you produce a spherical overlap region. It, it has a large uh, pressure, but the environment around it is vacuum. So that means uh, this system has large pressure gradients in all directions. <clears throat> so this pressure gradients in the radial direction will drive uh, uh, flow acceleration in all directions. <clears throat> so finally, we get this transverse flow uh, in heavy inclinations. Um, and it, more interestingly, we can look at those off central collisions. And in this case, the overlap region will have this Omen ship. And uh, you can see, uh, again, around it, this vacuum and uh, uh, the pressure gradients will be larger in the X direction than in the Y direction because the, this length is smaller in X direction. So that means uh, the, now the flow gradients is has some as most uh, dependence. It, uh, it, it is larger in the x direction, so it will drive larger flow in the x direction than in the y direction. And finally, we will arrive at some isotropic flow. <clears throat> On the other hand, we still can uh, average uh, this isotropic flow in different the uh, radio in, in different as most. Uh, angles, so we get this uh, averaged radial flow. Okay, so when we talk about the radial flow, we don't really care about its direction. Um, okay, so we, sh we should expect to see a large uh, uh, transverse flow or radial flow in heavy ion collisions. And uh, for off central collisions, we can get some isotropic flow. Um, so next is to see those uh, uh, effects from experimental measurements. <clears throat> um, okay, so um, to see the radio, we, we first talk about the radio flow, uh, we can look at those two examples in our life. Okay, so when the wind blows the plants, you can see those plants have, get some uh, collective uh, mo motion, right? So similarly in heavy ion collisions, uh, when we have large transverse expansion, then those emitted particles should also have some collective flow. Um, so how do we see those uh, collective flows? Um, one of the most characteristic uh, uh, measurements we can look at is the empty spectra of identified particles. So MT is the transverse mass. It is defined in this way. It's related to the mass and the transverse momenta of 
particle species. Um, here, this is, is the measurements <coughs> of pion kion proton uh, in PB collisions and uh, AA collisions um, at different uh, um, beam energies. Um, okay, so people in our field, of course, believe we really have seen uh, the collectivity uh, from the measurements. So um, maybe we are not that so sure about the PB collisions, uh, but so what, uh, what tells us that uh, there is really collective flow uh, from this plot? So before that, we can uh, try to get some insights from anal analytical calculations. Uh, from analytical work, uh, uh, people found this, these identified particle empty spectra can be a, approximate uh, like, like this. So this is just what is plotted here. Um, and uh, it can be approximate by this uh, exp expression. Um, so you can see with this expression, if we plot this uh, spectra in the log scale, then this uh, T slope in this expression should be uh, the inverse slope of this curve at different uh, MT, okay? Um, and people found uh, two uh, expressions uh, for T slope at two different limits. First in the relativistic limit when, where PT is much larger than the rest mass of the particle. And uh, this T slope is approximately uh, uh, given by this expression. Um, basically, uh, Tf is the uh, freeze out temperature. Uh, you can think of it as when the hydrons are emitted from the quark-gluon plasma, uh, that temperature. And uh, this term is related to the transverse flow. Okay. Um, and actually, this term is just the relativistic. Uh, uh, blue shift uh, factor. Um, so you can see this term. Uh, so this expression has has uh, no dependence on the particle's mass. So it works for all all particle species. Um, so this is the so-called empty scaling. Um, and uh, in another in the other limit, the, the net relativistic limit, when PT is much smaller than the uh, the mass of the particle then this slope is given by this uh, freeze out temperature plus uh, this kinetic energy of different particle species. Um, so, um, okay, so, sorry, I should mention this V perp is just the radial flow, okay? Um, so you can see this, uh, if you put back the Boltzmann uh, factor here, this is just is telling us the total energy of that particle is, uh, the thermal uh, energy uh, plus the kinetic energy uh, introduced by the collective flow motion. Um, and because of this uh, radial flow term, we can see it uh, brings in the mass dependence for this T slope. So that means in, the, in, in this relativistic limit, um, this slope will depend on um, the particle's uh, mass. Um, and that is uh, exactly what we see in the, uh, in the measurements. You can see at large PT uh, or large MT, uh, we, we see some universal uh, slope um, for different particle species. Here we focus on the LEs measurements, uh, those red circles. Um, and uh, in the low PT region, we, can, we do see uh, for different mass, uh, this slope is different for uh, protons have larger uh, mass. So this T slope should be larger. On the other hand, uh, that means this curve should be flatter in, in this plot. Um, I also mentioned this should not be uh, applied for pions. That is because uh, the low PT pions um, get a lot of contributions from resonance decays. So that also changes the slope. Um, okay, so we have seen the uh, signal of radio flow. Um, next, we will try to see the isotropic flows from the measurements. Um, again, so this is the a lumpy uh, 
uh, quadrigulone plasma we can produce in heavy ion collisions. Um, and we said uh, uh, the, so in this case, the, the, the spatial gradients of pressure should have some non-trivial distributions in the transverse plane. That means we will, it will drive some uh, non-trivial transverse flows actually, right? Um, so to see this, uh, of course, people can measure the as most distribution of final uh, particles <clears throat> in the transverse plane. Um, so to see this more uh, quantitatively, um, we can do the following. We first uh, decompose the initial uh, fluctuating geometry, geometric deformation into some spatial eccentricities. Uh, you, you can think of them as different modes in this deformation. For example, this is the ellipticity, this is triangularity. Um, you can imagine the, the pressure gradients will drive larger flows in those two directions by uh, ellipticity, and uh, the pressure gradient will drive larger flows in those three di directions uh, by triangularity, okay? Uh, to make this more clear, uh, I will show you this video made by Sion. You can see originally we have some ellipticity, uh, it's elongated in the y direction. And then we let the system expand. You can see there are more uh, particles get pushed in the uh, y direction. Similarly, this is the triangularity. Um, we let it expand. We see more particles that pushed into those three directions. Okay, just like what we would expect from hydrodynamic equations. <clears throat> so, um, so that means we, we, we should see some as, as most uh, distributions, uh, some patterns in, in the as most uh, distributions of final particles. Uh, what people do is to measure this as most distribution of final particles. So this is the measurements from uh, CMS at two different uh, pseudo rapidities. And then you can see uh, this is the asmos distribution. Uh, to see uh, the patterns corresponding to the anisotropic flows, uh, what people can do is to do the Fourier dec decomposition of this uh, asmos angle dependence of particles. Um, we get, again, get those different modes, right? For example, when n equals to two, that means you can see this term means there will be two peaks and two valleys in the, in, in the distribution as a function of uh, as most angle. Um, and, uh, and that is what uh, we see from this uh, measurements. Okay, so you can see this V2 components. You can see there are two, pe two peaks, two valleys. Similarly for V3, we will see three peaks um, as shown by those plots. <clears throat> okay, so those coefficients tells us how, the, the contribution from this mode, okay? When V2 is larger than that means uh, this component is contributing more to the as most angle distrib distribution. Um, V2 is called elliptic flow and V3 is called triangle, triangular flow. <clears throat> Um, correspondingly, we can define the um, initial spatial eccentricities in this way. Um, so uh, ellipticity will mostly uh, drive this elliptic flow, okay? Um, okay, so we have seen, uh, we have derived some hydrodynamic equations uh, in the ideal case, and then we have seen the effects from radial flow and isotropic flows. Um, um, any question at this point? Okay. There was a question in the Slack, but I think uh, Chun answered it already. Okay, great. Okay. All right, now we can move to the dissipative hydrodynamic equations and then see some dis dissipative effects. Um, so for this case, we will look at uh, systems which are near uh, local thermodynamic equilibrium. It is not imperfect local thermodynamic equilibrium anymore in this case. So that means the, uh, the 
thermodynamic, the distri particle distribution function will have some deviation from the equilibrium form, okay? Um, correspondingly, uh, those net baryon current and energy momentum tensor will get some dissipative corrections. Uh, for example, this is the net, this is the baryon diffusion current uh, in the net baryon current, and this is bulk viscous pressure, and this is shear stress tensor. We will talk about their uh, effects later. Uh, so we can define those quantities using uh, the particle distribution function as well. Uh, to do this, we really use this Landau matching condition. Uh, so what it means is that we ask the, uh, those ideal sectors only get a contributions from the equilibrium distribution and those dissipative corrections get only get contributions from this uh, deviation from equilibrium distribution. And then in this way, we can get the uh, definitions of those uh, uh, dissipative corrections using the particle distribution function. For example, this NMU is defined using this delta F, similarly to, the, uh, to how net, so the ideal sector is defined in terms of uh, equilibrium distribution. Okay, so similarly for bulk viscous pressure and shear stress tensor. Um, so that means if we want to get the evolution equations for those dissipative corrections, we need to, we, we can look at the evolution of delta F and then we can derive some equations for them. Um, okay, so let's try to get some intuition on how the delta F evolves. Um, so we said in heavy collisions, the system expands and accelerates. Um, so the temperature decreases. So that means this equilibrium distribution needs to be adjusted to match this decreasing temperature. Okay, so we can look at this plot. Um, so this is, uh, let's assume this equilibrium distribution look like, uh, looks like this, and then we will plot it in a log scale as function of u dot p. It, it should be a straight line. Um, and then from um, when a system cools down from higher temperature to low temperature, then the equilibrium distribution should be adjusted from this line to this line. So um, overall, you can see those, that means particles need to be drifted from uh, high, high energies to low energies on average. Um, so that needs to be achieved by collisions between those particles. Um, but this cannot be adjusted instant, instantaneously. Um, even for uh, if uh, for the system with uh, infinitely strong strongly couplings because of uh, quantum mechanics, so that means this particle distribution function will always have deviation from equilibrium distribution, and we have this uh, delta f. Um, okay, a quick summary we can see here: the microscopic expansion drives the system away from equilibrium, um, as we see from this temperature is cooling. And then microscopic collisions drive it back by adjusting this uh, particle distribution function. So the evolution of uh, particle distribution function can be given by the Boltzmann equation. Um, and when the system is not far away from local uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, we can use this relaxation time approximation. Um, so here in the Boltzmann equation, we use this uh, RTA kernel uh, to approximate this uh, collision kernel. Um, and this is exactly the delta F, okay? So in this, from this equation, we can get the evolution of delta F, and then we, we can derive equations for those dissipative corrections um, from the previous slide. And uh, uh, people arrive at those relaxation equations for those dissipative components. And we need those new equations to close the system because we introduced those new variables. Okay, so you can see they basically have very similar structures. For example, this bulk viscous pressure, you can see it relaxes to this term on the time scale controlled by its relaxation time. Similarly for those uh, two quantities. And those terms are called the Navier-Stokes limit of, uh, of those quantities. 
Uh, so what it means is, is that when the relaxation time is zero, then those terms will stay at those uh, Navier-Stokes limit. And in other words, we can think of those term, terms as the driving force of those dissipative components. Uh, for example, you can think of this, ter this term as the, uh, this term drives the bulk viscous pressure. And we know this theta is the expansion rate, it's positive, and zeta is the bulk, viscos the bulk viscosity, it is also positive. So this term is together is negative. Okay, so uh, in, uh, expanding a fluid bulk viscous pressure tends to be negative, okay? Um, similarly, shear, uh, shear stress tensor is driven by sigma mu nu. Um, so it is uh, basically, this sigma mu nu is non-zero when there is flow gradients. So flow gradients drives shear stress tensor. Um, and uh, mu is driven by the gradients of chemical potential over temperature. Um, okay, so with this in mind, we can we can look at their uh, their effects later. Um, okay, now we can derive those dissipative hydrodynamic equations uh, besides the previous equations we just looked at. Uh, again, we uh, we will use the conservation laws. So here uh, here we uh, explicitly write the decomposition of mu and t mu nu uh, with the ideal sector and the dissipative corrections. Um, so you can see here, this uh, bulk viscous pressure is always added uh, to the thermal uh, equilibrium pressure, P. Uh, so you can think of it as effective pressure. <clears throat> okay, so in this case, t mu nu in the local rest frame now becomes like this. Um, uh, bulk viscous pressure is added to pressure in the spatial uh, diagonal elements and uh, shear stress tensor introduced those off equilibrium, sorry, uh, introduced those uh, off diagonal terms. Uh, they are all in the spatial uh, elements uh, in the local rest frame. Okay, now we introduce those uh, new independent variables, one in bulk viscous bulk viscous pressure, five in shear stress tensor, because it is symmetric and chiseless. Uh, three in uh, baryon diffusion current, because it is orthogonal to the flow velocity. Um, and we just uh, solve those, those quantities using the uh, relaxation equations in the previous slide. Okay, now we can um, write those conservation laws with this dissipation, okay? Um, so we focus on this acceleration equation again. Um, again, you can see now the spatial gradients of thermal pressure plus bulk viscous pressure drives the flow acceleration. As we said, because uh, the bulk viscous pressure tends to be negative in an expanding fireball. So that means effective uh, uh, pressure is smaller than the ideal case. The gradient is also smaller. So when there is bulk viscous pressure, the acceleration of the fluid is uh, slower than in the ideal case. Um, and for shear stress tensor, you can see, uh, this is uh, the mu components, but uh, with a shear stress tensor, it also introduces effects from the other components as well. So shear stress tensor couples uh, different components of flow velocity. Um, for example, the acceleration in, in the X direction will also introduce some uh, change in the flow uh, of Y direction. Um, so uh, shear stress sensor will tend to reduce the flow and isotropy in different directions. <clears throat> okay, so here we can summarize everything uh, from the uh, viscous effects from those uh, viscous components. Um, so, uh, I didn't really mention those coefficients. They are very important transport uh, uh, properties. This eta is a shear viscosity. Um, so you can see when eta is larger uh, than with the same sigma mu nu, uh, bulk, uh, sorry, shear stress tensor is larger. So shear viscosity measures, measures um, the resistance to flow gradient. 
bulk viscous bulk viscous bulk viscosity measures the resistance to uh, expansion. Um, okay, um, I won't read everything. Uh, any question so far? Okay, great. Now we can look at some uh, measurements to see those the effects from those dissipative uh, effects. Uh, before that, let me uh, show you this. All these dissipative effects will increase the entropy in production. First, let's look at the effects from shear stress tensor. Uh, here I'm showing you the simulation of two different hydros, the ideal hydro and hydro with shear viscosity. With, uh, from the same initial condition, okay? And then you can see with shear stress tensor, uh, the system becomes uh, smoother. As we said, shear stress tensor smooths out the flow uh, as a job, okay? So this uh, can be uh, seen in some uh, theoretical modeling. Um, so here, let's focus on this plot first. Um, so this is from this initial condition, and the horizontal axis is different charge particle multiplicity. Let's focus on, on those dots. Um, you can see vertical axis is V2 normalized by uh, ellipticity. Um, you can see here, they are corresponding to different uh, shear viscosities. When you increase shear viscosity, this ratio decreases. So that means with the same ellipticity, V2 decreases when you have larger shear viscosity. Um, very similarly, you can also look at PD differential flows. Um, here, when we increase the shear viscosity, you can see overall this P, uh, V2 is smaller at different PT. Um, so this is the very characteristic signature of uh, uh, shear viscosity. It reduces I, 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 isotropic flows. Um, okay, now uh, effects from bulk viscous pressure um, here. I'm showing you the energy uh, distribution in the transverse plane at this time, uh, first with shear stress uh, only, and then we also turn on bulk disk pressure. You can see in those regions, um, it is hotter. Um, so this can be understood in two expect, uh, aspects. First, because bulk, bulk viscous pressure slows down the radio expansion, so the pressure cooling is slower. On the other hand, because bulk viscous pressure can increase the entropy production and uh, so that you have a hotter uh, fireball with bulk viscous pressure. Um, we can also look at some uh, observables. Um, this is the uh, identify the particle yields in different centralities for the case with shear only and uh, sh both shear and bulk. Um, so for the solid lines, you can see this Shear viscosity is uh, smaller in this calculation, but still uh, we see larger yields for those particles. So that means indeed bulk viscosity can increase the entropy production and thus you arrive at larger yields. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, this is the mean PT of identified particles. We see the solid lines with bulk viscosity are uh, suppressed compared to the dashed lines. Um, so this is a very uh, characteristic signature of bulk, viscos of bulk viscosity, which reduces the mean PT of identified particles by slowing down the radio expansion. Uh, finally, we can also talk about effects from um, baryon diffusion current. Um, this is the baryon density um, in the long longitudinal direction. Um, so initially it has two peaks like this. Uh, we remember the, uh, the baryon diffusion current is driven by the gradient of chemical potential over temperature. Um, so very easily you can expect uh, that because of this double peak structure, the gradients will drive baryon diffusion current in those directions at different space-time rapidities. For example, at mid rapidity, uh, there will be baryon diffusion current pointing towards uh, mid rapidity, which will carry more baryon densities to this mid rapidity region, similarly for forward and backward rapidities. Um, so finally, <clears throat> if you calculate the net proton distribution, for example, highly related to the uh, net 
variant density distribution, you will see when you have larger uh, variant diffusion um, current, um, this you will get more net proton numbers produced in the meta repeated region. Okay. Um, okay. Now we have seen um, basic specs to, uh, from different dissipative uh, components. Uh, let me finally briefly talk about this particleization. Um, so that means, you know, um, when the Q QCD, uh, sorry, when the QGP fireball expands and cools down, then finally uh, the temperature will be uh, low and uh, color confinement will happen uh, and protons will get confined into hydrons again. So in practice, we call this particleization which means we convert hydrodynamic fields into hydronic particles. Um, in practice, we usually do this on a constant switching temperature or switching energy uh, density. Uh, here, this plot is a evolution uh, of temperature as function of proper time and X. You see when time, time increases, the temperature decreases. Um, so those white bounds are the uh, fluid cells at this switch in temperature. Uh, together, they are called the freeze-out surface. So we will do this uh, particleization on this freeze-out surface uh, using this Cooper Fry prescription. Um, so this surface is the 3D hypersurface in this 4D space-time. And uh, on this surface, the invariant momentum distributions of particle species is given by this Cooper Fry formula. Um, Okay, so this integral is carried out on this uh, hypersurface and d sigma uh, is the surface element. <clears throat> so in practice, we, uh, we assume this as probable probability distributions of uh, particles and sample particles. After you get some sampled particles, you can feed them into hydronic transport, for example, smash or UQMD and let them rescatter. Uh, uh, some people don't feed those particles into those transport codes. Instead, they let those unstable resonances decay directly and get some uh, final stable particles. Uh, there can be some effects in those two different ways, which will be discussed in the next session, following this session. Uh, they have some uh, effects on different me measurements it will be discussed here in this session. Okay. Um, let me finally talk about this uh, data-driven constraints on QCD matter properties. Uh, we talked about uh, the viscous effects uh, with a few transport properties, uh, shear viscosity, bulk viscosity, charge conductivity, those things. But there are other properties uh, which needs to be constrained. Um, so currently the, mod the, up the uh, what do we, what people currently is doing is to use different kinds of observables to constrain some uh, uh, universal uh, properties of the QCD matter, right? Um, so this is the uh, multi-messenger heavy ion physics. You can see some uh, flow measurements of hydrons, uh, dileptons, photons, and uh, heavy quarks, uh, jet quenching strangeness particles, uh, different distributions. Um, and then we, we want to quantify the properties of the core gluon plasma. These are the categories of measurements from the uh, previous slide, basically. And then we want to constrain those properties, for example, thermodynamic properties of the uh, QCD matter characterized by the equation of state, um, those viscosities, conductivity, uh, jet quenching properties, and uh, phase boundaries. Uh, basically, we want to uh, locate the phase boundary between QGP phase and hydron gas phase in the phase diagram. Um, so in practice, we can tune those, uh, those properties uh, by tuning the parameters. And then we can see how those uh, measurements, how those observables respond to those parameters. But uh, uh, to quantify the core Coulomb plasma, we want to do this uh, the other way around. So we want to use data to do the parameter estimation. So uh, currently, uh, 
um, people use this data-driven phenomenological constraints. Uh, for example, this is a work done by the, by the JustScape collaboration using different measurements, uh, at different uh, beam energies for different collision systems. And then people can use a basing parameter estimation to extract the thermodynamic uh, or transport the uh, properties of the QCD matter at different um, temperature. And uh, also there is a very interesting widget. Um, you can tune in those parameters and see how those uh, observables respond response to those parameters. We will do this as one of our exercises in a hands-on session. Um, okay, basically to summarize, we have seen that uh, the multi-stage frameworks with relativistic dissipative hydrodynamics are remarkably successful in describing evolution of systems, uh, producing heavy ion collisions, and we are in an era of extracting robust and precise properties of QCD matter from multi-messenger measurements. <clears throat> to summarize, I've, I've said this before. Um, so for those hybrid models, uh, relativistic, relativistic dissipative hydrodynamics is the core um, and uh, dissipative effects are essential for understanding different uh, measurements. And we looked into some hydrodynamic equations, both in the ideal and dissipative cases and we discussed the, the collective behaviors in heavy collisions. We also discussed those dissipative effects on some characteristic observables uh, from those uh, dissipative components. Okay, so in the summary, we are in a very amazing era to precisely extracting the properties of QCD matter in a very robust, precise way. Um, and uh, and that is what uh, one, one of the main goals of the JustScape collaboration. And uh, we will see this uh, in this summer school uh, in different sessions. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, thanks to the TAs and chairs. Thank you very much for the talk, uh, Yipei. So uh, we can take some questions, I think. Yeah, so there's, yeah, so there's a question on the chat uh, by Wei Bing. Uh, do you want to speak up directly? Yeah, I, 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 I saw that question. Um, wait, I'm not sure why I quit. So the question is about uh, uh, hydronization and the particleization, right? Can you still see my slides? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Great. Okay, hydronization is basically a more physical process when the, the partons get confined into hydrons. Particleization is more what we is a more practical process when we uh, switch the language from a hydrodynamic language to transport language of particles. Um, so it is a more practical uh, name in, in my uh, point of view. So, um, so we, call when we call that process particleization when we, when we sample particles from hydrodynamic fields on the freeze surface in some sense. Yes, it's basically the same thing. Uh, uh, more one is more physical, one is more practical. Um, okay. Um, any other questions? There are a couple of questions on the Slack, <clears throat> but I think Chun, oh, there's a new one on the Slack right now which, uh, from Pepe, which says, uh, how is the initial state determined 
for three plus one D from the mid rapidity plane. In other words, what is the prescription for initial energy entropy density as a function of spatial pseudo rapidity? What is the reliability range of pseudo rapidity for hydro simulation? Eta less than 1.5 question, eta less than two, eta less than three. I understand reliability decreases with increasing rapidity, but what would be good enough? Um, okay, that is a very complicated question. So basically uh, to get uh, reliable initial conditions for 3D, uh, you, you need to consider the space-time evolution of those initial collisions between uh, those participant, in, uh, participant nucleons. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, when they collide with each other, then you will have some energy loss. And uh, uh, so that will affect their, their evolution in the space and the time. Um, you know, those dynamical uh, uh, models, um, Chen is one of the developers in this direction. Um, so, uh, of I mean, a reliable model should should be able to describe different uh, processes. For example, uh, from um, AA collisions to small systems. Um, uh, I mean, I think we are still at a very early stage. Uh, so the idea is to, to develop such models and then compare to different repeatedly dependent me measurements and then to constrain such models. Um, yeah, um, that is basically what I, I can say. So, I mean, just to further clarify, there are several different models out there that deal with initial uh, energy or entropy density, right? So, you know, like we use Trento, but there's also, um, um, <clears throat> I'm blanking on the name right now. Uh, IP Glasma, mm -hmm. and then we have uh, you know we have a free streaming, or there's also this um, the, the scattering based streaming, you know, uh, compost, right? So so I guess maybe the the answer is that there's there's a multiple different ways right now, right? So but right. how would you do? I guess let me just zero in on the second part of the question, which is uh, how would you know when it's good enough? If it is good enough, then we should be able to describe different measurements, right? Okay, so just you know, by by a by a more sophisticated Bayesian analysis, that be right. a good answer. Okay. Okay, we have another question from Gabriel Soares. It says on the Slack, is only temperature considered to define the particleization hypersurface? Okay, so when the chemical potential is zero, then uh, there are one-to-one -one correspondence between temperature and uh, energy density, for example. You can also use energy density to define the hypersurface, but at low beam energies, uh, when the chemical potential is then zero, then uh, you know, uh, for the same temperature, you can have different energy density with different chemical potential. Uh, so in that case, maybe you can use the constant energy density instead, because uh, with the some uh, constant energy density, we see uh, we see those those lines. Uh, they follow the uh, the switch. The uh, how do I say uh, the phase boundary extracted from the beam energy measurements. Um, so in that case, maybe it's better. Um, to use a constant energy density. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Pepe and uh, Gabriel for the questions. Do we have any, any other questions? Okay, if there is no question, then we will uh, uh, switch to the hands-on session. So we will get the code uh, uh, compiled. Uh, and when the code compiles, we can take a break. Um, so let me show the other slides first. Not sure. 
you see my slides full screen now we see the presenter's view oh easy does it work now it works yes. okay great so uh in this hands-on session uh today and tomorrow we will do a few exercises uh, with different goals for different exercises uh, for example in the first exercise we will run the uh, Jetscape framework with different with multi-stage modulus and then we will calculate some observables compared to uh, experimental measurement to 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 so that we can get a feeling of how to use Jetscape to to run event by event simulations and then tomorrow uh, tomorrow we will run some uh, different cases um, in the second case we will run ideal hydro and plot some uh, evolution of flow and temperature and see how hydrodynamic works um, in the third exercise we will run the case with shear only and zero bog so that we can look at effects from shear viscosity and in fourth case we will run it with bog viscosity okay so to see those effects we will compare to this ideal evolution and uh, finally we will uh, play with this just skip widget it is uh, corresponding to re re realistic simulations with multi-dimensional parameter space and you will get intuitions on how different observables respond to different parameters um, and uh, today we will uh, we will do this first exercise uh, okay now um, i know uh, in Chaturanga's <clears throat> session, in his slide, he said uh, people should build the framework, framework with those modulus. Huh? Um, so maybe someone has done that. If you have done this, then let's do this poll. Uh, if you did, if you did this, then you press yes on Zoom, and you can take a 15 minutes break. Um, if you haven't done this yet, that's okay. We didn't really require you to do that, and then. We will get the framework uh, starting and uh, compiling, and then we can take a break. Okay. Uh, so, can we do the poll now and see if okay? Great. Many people have done that. Okay. So, if you have have done that if please really make sure you have those modules on otherwise it won't work for this session okay so if you have done this then make sure you can open that docker container uh, and uh, you and then otherwise uh, please stay here and then we will spend a few minutes to get it start to compiling and then we can take a break okay um, great you can you can stay around or you can you can take a break it's up to you okay now um, now let's get uh, the framework uh, compiled okay so let me stop sharing this And share the other thing. Can you see my screen now? Uh, one with browser and one with terminal. Okay. Um, all right. Maybe so we only see the terminal. Half screen. So you said, can you see the browser in the terminal? Yeah, now we can see the browser in the terminal. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so the uh, the instructions are here on GitHub. You can you can click on the uh, link in the slide, it's uh, Intico, or you can get here. Um, so we will uh, do this. It will take a few minutes to get the code and start compiling. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, let's get started here. Um, let's see. 
Okay, so let's, let's do this. <clears throat> so I believe you have downloaded the, the JavaScript uh, framework from the pre preparation session, okay? So you should be able to have those uh, folders, okay? You get into JavaScript and you go to external package. You should see uh, those modules we need. Uh, ISS, music, and Trento, uh, and Freestream, Milner. Okay. Um, okay, so after you, I think everyone has downloaded this, these packages. Um, okay, so here we have assumed that you downloaded it in your home directory. If you downloaded it, at, Elsewhere, then you need to modify those uh, path accordingly. Um, okay, now we need to set up a Docker container. Uh, so here we will use a different name for our session. It's called JS Hydro, JavaScript Hydro. Uh, we want to make those sessions independent because not everyone is attending all the sessions. Um, so we will start a new Docker. If you have built the framework using a different Docker, that's fine. You just need to open that Docker. So now we set up a, a new Docker, okay? So because I have already had started this Docker, so I will get some error, but if you don't have this, that's you, you will be able to open a new Docker, okay? And then we, we can start now. Let me start my old Docker. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm in the Docker. <clears throat> so you can see this uh, line. Okay. It shows Docker start with those things. It may take a few minutes, I think. Um, is everyone doing great? Who is following? Um, can, can you do a poll? Let me know if you are doing good. Okay, great. All right, so after you are done with setting up the Docker, then we go to, we will <clears throat> run those uh, scripts, okay. First, we get into JustScape directory. And then you make if this. I could, if I could just. Um... Is anyone talking? Abhijit? Lipe, can you hear me? Yes. Right, I just wanna point out that uh, Derek just put a comment in the Slack that says, please ensure that you have the latest version of the summer school code. The July 20th Hydro has changed recently. Y yes, so. I actually, I, I will um, ask people to, to get updated uh, those okay. materials later, okay? All right, thank you. So yeah, please uh, run those scripts and then uh, compile the framework. So I will not, I will not do that again because my Laptop, the laptop is really slow. I don't want to be the, the slowest one. Uh, so, so here you can see we have those flags. We are we are having. Music, ISS, and free stream. Um, then we will build the framework. So, okay, can I uh, get another poll if you are uh, running this make? 
uh, this line. And if it is running, then please, uh, please uh, answer yes, and then otherwise, no. Okay, seems great. Uh, okay, let's let's take a break then. We can the code will 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 be compiling. It takes some time. Um, so let's get back at uh, thirty, I think. Thirty past ten. Okay. So if you have any question, you can stay here, and then we will help you. Otherwise. Uh, feel free to take a break. <laughs> 